Paul said that he was uh, blessed by the color of the fall season. <clears throat> I'm blessed by the odors I'm smelling from the kitchen. <laughs> and, uh, we're going to be sure to be done in time to get over there. We love to, to eat the eat meetings. Reminded me of some boys that were in kindergarten. They were supposed to bring something to present what church they went to. And so they came together, and the first little girl it was uh, had a set of rosary beads. She said, I'm Catholic. This helps us to pray. Well, the other little boy stood up and he had a, a menorah, a Jewish candle. He said, no, I'm Jewish and this is a representation of our religion. And the other little boy stood up and he had a casserole pot. He says, I'm Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> we do know how to feed and that's all right. I'm glad for that. When you turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6, Dwight L. Moody was uh, one of the greatest Christian and preachers that ever lived. And he was in the last generation. Moody Bible Institute is named after him. I think some of you, one of you at least, went to that facility. But, uh, Dwight Moody said that he heard one time a fellow gave three things that he learned over 42 years. So Brother Moody thought I'd better pay attention if they took 43, 42 years to learn three things. And the guy said, number one, I learned that I could do nothing to earn my salvation. Number two, he said, uh, I learned that God does not require me to do anything for my salvation. Number three, I learned that Jesus did it all. Well, you don't need to take 42 years to learn three things. Romans chapter 6 is going to tell us three things that you need to know. This is one of the most powerful passages in the Word of God and also most difficult. I tell my wife I spend the first part of my week working with the Word, studying the Word, trying to understand the Word. I spend the last part of my week trying to make it simple and making it short. And uh, two, two things that don't always go together. But there's three words in this chapter that will help us. We pitch our mental tents around that and it will help clarify what this is all about. There's something we must know. There's something we must reckon. If you're a Texan, we'd say it's something you must count on. And there's something that we must yield or present. So the first point, and I encourage you to take your outlines and uh, follow along. And if you are a little hard to pay attention, turn on the back and it's presented in a visual form. You might be a visual learner. So I found a couple little graphs and pictures that will help you. But something we must know. And so we studied chapter 5 last week. And we found out that sin from Adam came into the world. And that salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ is offered to the world. Because of Adam, sin was imputed to all the world, the human family. But there's another representative in our human family. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. We found that through the cross, he removes all of our sin and our guilt. And he adds to us life and righteousness. Two parts to the gospel there. So on that basis, he can move into the life of the believer. Remember, he gives us life. He can move into the life of the believer and uh, make them to be what they are. He's already declared them righteous. How does that work out? What does that look like? How is that produced in the life of the believer? So up until chapter 6, I want you to notice that Paul did not discuss the life of the saint. He didn't say a word about how the saint was going to live. Anytime I preach the book of Romans, 
which the first five chapters emphasizes the grace of God and the free gift of salvation and the complete forgiveness and final forgiveness of God. Always, older people who've been around longer want to know, but what? You've got to add something to that. And they want to get to the behavior part when God is emphasizing the believing part. God doesn't ask you to do anything. He doesn't want you to change your behavior, your conduct, your character. He doesn't want you to give anything. You can't do anything for salvation. That is complete free gift of God until you understand that you're bankrupt. You're without help, without hope. That all of your worship of righteousness with that which you call works that are good, God calls filthy rags. He's not interested in that. Five chapters, he doesn't say a thing about, what about the believer? How is he supposed to live? Where do we run to always how we're behaving? The devil loves to get you preoccupied on your failure. <clears throat> so, on this basis, you can see that salvation is not complicated. It's very clear, very plain, and uh, all God does is he invites you to believe on him, to trust him, to receive him. That settles it. It's not simply the best way. It is the only way. Anytime you add to that first five chapters your work, you are going to mess it up. So get over it. Don't let the devil keep you preoccupied with what God has already finished with. So and I'm just trying to, to emphasize that he did not talk about the life of the believer until that happens in your life. God is not interested in your good works. The righteousness of man is filthy rags in his sight. So I'm just saying, you know, God doesn't ask you to do anything for him. After you're saved, after you've got that matter settled, then he talks to you about how good works are produced in the life of the believer. How Christian life or living comes and where it comes from. So, simply, chapter 1 through 5, salvation or justification is the free gift of God for you. Can you say amen? amen. It's a free gift. Amen. You've received him. You have it. Exclamation point. That is not a question mark. And so we don't need to go around, oh, woe is me, because, yeah, God knows all about how woe well you are, but you look to Jesus Christ and how wonderful he is. Amen. Marvelous grace we sang. And then sanctification, chapter 6 through 8. Listen is the free gift of his life in and through you. Did you think that the saint is going to work out righteousness in his life? That is not so. It is the life he gave in you, teaching you how to work, let that work out through you. And we're going to see that as we go on now. So chapter 6 now he begins to discuss that issue. Simply put, chapter 6 is the ability of God to make a sinner what God has already made him, righteous. Not only righteous in position, but righteous in practice. But it ain't your flesh. It isn't you. It's him in you and through you. So, there is right here the key to Christian living. I'm so happy to share this with you. But before you get to chapter 6, verse 1, where that preposterous question is, what shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? We need to go back and see why they're asking that question. So we've got to go back to chapter 5, the end of verses, which we didn't get to, by the way. There were no chapter divisions when the Bible was given originally. Those were put in there so the preacher knows there's a place to stop. 
but it sort of interrupted the whole thing. If you start back in chapter 5, verse 20, you're going to find out why this question comes up. Chapter 5, verse 20, we're going to do a rewind here. We're going to review for a minute. Moreover, the law entered, why? That the sin or the offense might abound. Now, you've got to put your, yourself in the mindset of the religionist, the Jew back in that day. They were raised under the Old Testament. Obedience brought blessing. And now all of a sudden here comes a message of grace. That would have frustrated them to no end. Especially those that thought they had something going for themselves. Like the Pharisees. They thought they were pretty good. I mean, after all, they were just living a separated life. They were doing about maybe six out of the ten. But they were only doing six out of the 613. Because you understand the ten was not the whole law. And if anybody doesn't keep the whole law, He's guilty. So that was a, a quite a, a serious thing. You would say, well, look how good I'm doing. Stick in that plum and pull out a, no, stick in that thumb and pull out a plum. What a good boy am I. That's what they thought. And so everything that God was pretty pleased with them. And then our word of God says, no, it's a pass or fail. You are either a hundred percent keeping the law or you're a hundred percent lost. You're either a hundred percent trusting the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation or you're not saved. it. Because that's the only place salvation is. It's law or grace. So many people today I've found are afraid of this grace message in our churches. They say, watch out for that grace message. It may lead to sin. Friend, that's not what the Bible says. I want you to remember Titus chapter 2, verse 11 will be on the screen. It is the grace of God that brings salvation. Okay, we say amen to that. But now listen, you who are given to good works, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live so... What is teaching us? Not law. Grace. Grace. You understand in the Greek, if you go back and look at that, and you can look at it in any, any ask Siri should tell you. That word is hyperson. Hyperperson. Hyper. Sometimes you say you talk about hyper grace. And that's what God called it. It's hyper grace. It is grace that is greater than you can imagine. It's better than what you ever think. And so then we would ask the question. If it's grace, what is the role of the law? What's the role of the law? You got it on your outline? Don't be looking at me all the time. Look at your outline. Well, I go a lot of trouble getting that ready to help teach this. <laughs> you might ask, what's the role of the law? Romans 3.19. Now that'll be on the screen. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. Are you under the law? The Old Testament law? Always amazes me that uh, Gentiles living in America 2,000 years after the law, 6,000 miles away from Israel, want to get themselves under the law. When the Bible says you never had the law, you weren't heirs of salvation, you didn't have the covenants, you, don't, you were without. We try to get ourselves back on the law. But he says to those who are under the law, if you want to get yourself under the law, what, what's it all about? That every mouth may be stopped. All it will do is convict you of your sin. And all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Law came in to show us that we had a problem, a serious, serious flaw. The law entered that the offense might abound. The law of God emphasizes, causes sin to increase, not decrease. How 
how often I go into churches and they have the Ten Commandments posted down there someplace in their Sunday school area and don't explain that is not the way you get right with God. One time we had a neighbor, they weren't church people, but they knew we were. And her teenagers had messed up and offended everything, and she said, I'm going to make them write the Ten Commandments over and over and over and over. I said, that's not going to make them right. That's not going to make them mad. That's all it's going to make them mad. The Ten Commandments weren't given for that purpose. It was to show us how bad we all are, really. So imagine that legalistic Jew back there. That doesn't seem right. You mean, if I get out the rule book and I seriously and sincerely try to keep that, then it's going to produce the opposite? That doesn't seem fair. And it's like God says, yeah, it is kind of radical, isn't it? So what was the purpose of the law? We just read it. It was that every mouth might be stopped. James 1.23 says the law was like a mirror. It wasn't meant to cleanse you. It was meant to show you where you had a blemish. Now, my wife used to have a mirror. I don't know if she threw it away. I haven't seen it. I haven't looked very careful. But it used to be on the one side. It showed your face. And then you could flip it. And all of a sudden, it magnified like seven times. You saw every pore. Every blemish. I thought, who wants to look at that? But the law is like that mirror. You're coming along and you're looking at the mirror of the Old Testament. Jesus comes along in the New Testament, Sermon on the Mount, flips the mirror, makes the law point too low. It magnifies. You think you were all right, but now look how God sees you. And no matter how good you think you are, he says in Matthew 5, 48, except you be perfect like your father, you're not going to make it. Who could meet that? That's the whole purpose of the law, to pound a nail in the coffin of works religion. And I find a lot of folks today in our circles are involved in a work religion. And they got a scale, they're marking themselves off. I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm doing the other thing. So, Galatians 2.16 says that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. You're not going to make it. If that's the way you're trying to come, you're not going to make it. In Romans 10, 4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Now, folks, we are not saying the law went away. The law is good and holy. The problem is we can't keep it. And when you turn to Christ, you're not under law anymore. It's the end of the law for those, for righteousness, for those that believe. So the law uh, in the Old Testament refers to a works-based religion, but by application it can be by to any system of works. So what's the proper use of the law? See, I'm saying the law did not go away. The law is there, but we died to the law, we're going to find out. So, in 1 Timothy 1, 8 and 9, and we need to write this down or put this someplace, but we know that the law is good. The law is right, righteous and good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for righteous people. Didn't we just find out in Romans chapter 5 that the Lord has made us righteous, we're righteous in the Lord? But for the lawless, the insubordinate, the ungodly, for those that turn away from God, is that you? No, that's not you. If you've received Jesus Christ as Savior, you have his righteousness. We spent five chapters talking about that. Well, we started in chapter five, so. So, knowing that, to go back to chapter five here, we're looking at this emphasis on grace. 
it gets more radical than what I have already said. The law commanded that sin would increase. It's even more outrageous because it says, where sin abounded, grace increased much more. You can't out sin God's grace. Why? Because well, grace increases. Where, where sin increases, grace abounds more. Are well, you saying, preacher, that you can sin more and you'll have more grace? Well, I didn't say it. I just quoted it. So the reason why we have this question in chapter 6, verse 1, is coming from that. There's so much emphasis on grace. The response is, well, then if that's so, I'll just go out and make a record in sinning, and that way there'll be a more grace. You see, that shows that they don't understand what grace did in their life when they see the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to cover that real quickly. quickly. So this is what brought that question. And Paul is going to address it in chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? He says that same thing in verse 15. So he answers the question with a question. The reason not to sin the reason to behave now that we're not under law, you ask a question. Do you not know? When he asks that question, do you not know, you know, he knows, they do not know. And he's going to explain what they should know. Hey, you know, God, this is the first point. They should know. You should know. You should know. He said, don't you know what happened at your new birth? When you were regenerated, don't you know what your new identity is, which we just covered last week? Don't you know what your new heart is? Don't you know what your new nature, Christ in you, wants? Don't you know what your new life is all about? Don't you know that the Holy Spirit of God now lives in you? You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit gives you discernment and dynamic to live differently. You say, don't you know? Folks, it's important that we know what he's talking about here because this is the key to your Christian life. There are some things we must know. Verse 3 says, Or do you not know that as many as of us were baptized or identified with Jesus Christ were identified, baptized into his death, do you not know what happened at your new birth, which is baptism represents what happened to you when you received Christ as your Savior, your new identity, the Holy Spirit? You see, if you think that the cross and salvation only has to do with a sin issue, then you might ask this question of chapter 6, verse 1. If you think that it just took care of a ticket on the way to heaven and a book of rules and maybe a golden crown when you got to heaven. You don't know the other part of the gospel. You don't know the new, about the new man. You don't know about the new creature. You don't know about the Holy Spirit and the new dynamic that's in your heart and life. You do not know what satisfies your new spirit. The chapter 7, verse 6. Look over there. It's chapter 7, verse 6. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by. Now listen, that's important. The law didn't die. We died to the law. Having died to what we were held by, so that we should so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit. How? Is a Christian life lived not by your effort, it's by the newness of the Spirit. I hope to make that plain today. So three things happened when you received, or you received uh, when you were regenerated, regenerated when you were born. And by the way, over in chapter eight and verse nine, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, I want you to notice it's called 
the Spirit of Christ is not his. And so I was going to say three things that happened that were received at our new birth. We, had a, we received a new spirit. We received a new heart. And we received the Holy Spirit. Got that? This is the key to living the Christian life. And so I need to discuss this matter of a new spirit because I find there's a lot of confusion about this. You know in John 3, and this is verse chapters that you know very well, Jesus said, I say to you, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He says in verse 5, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit. In verse 6, that which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel, I say to you, must be born again, born again, born again of the Spirit. Let me give you a quick explanation. In Adam, we had a human spirit. Man is created, body, soul, spirit. You have a human spirit. The problem is, it's dead to God, but alive to sin. That is how we're born. But we have a human spirit. That's why believers, unbelievers are called slaves to sin or children of wrath. Now the part of us, it's that part of us at regeneration where we gain a new human spirit. We're regenerated. We're alive to God now. That's where God communicates with you. His spirit to your spirit. We were dead to God in our human spirit. Now, we're born of the spirit. We have the spirit. We're alive. Our spirit is alive to God. And uh, so the Old Testament prophesied this in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will put my spirit in you and cause you to walk on my way. I'm going to give you a new heart that's going to be a new desire. I'm going to put my Holy Spirit in you. That's a new dynamic so you can walk in my way. That happened when we got saved. Well now, when we get, if we're going to get a new spirit, that certainly implies that we had an old spirit. We had a human spirit. Every unbeliever has a human spirit, but it's dead to God, alive to sin. We say this all the time, I'm a born-again Christian, based in John 3.3. 3. It has become so common, we've almost become numb to what it means, and sometimes we don't even understand what it means. It's that that spiritual part of us that was dead to God has been now made alive to God. That's the born again. That's the regeneration. It's now become alive to God and dead to sin. We'll explain that. Born of the Spirit, John 3, verse 5. And you had to die first in order to be made alive. And that's what we did in Jesus. So that's what Romans 6 is talking about. There's a spiritual surgery, a transplant, down below your body, down below your emotions, your soul, in the deepest part of your life, in your spirit. There's been a radical surgery, a miracle of God that changed you from being dead in the spirit, or, or see, dead, dead to God, to being alive to God. That's being born again. And um, so that had to be killed in order for us to be made alive. I'll get to that. That was the part of us that was crucified with Christ. A new spirit now. And that spirit indwelled by God's spirit. So it's a new creation. And then he says in verse 2, that uh, in number 2, not only do we receive a, a new spirit, but we receive a new heart. Because your old heart wanted sin. You did have a wicked heart. It wanted sin. It craved sin. 
But baptism celebrates a new heart. Look at verse 17 as we jump ahead. But God, be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart. Something happened in your heart that made you have an obedient heart. That is the regeneration. God has created you a new heart. 2 Corinthians 3, Paul said, clearly, in verse 3, clearly you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not in tablets of stone, but on a tablet of flesh, that is, of the heart. Something has happened inside us. Shall we continue to sin that grace may have brought? That is a question that people ask that do not know what happened when they got saved. They do not know what their baptism represented. And we're going to talk about that as we go on. And then the third thing is that we have now the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. I call that a new dynamic. <laughs> Chapter 8 in verse 11 says, But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. We have received the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? So what I'm saying is, a person who asks the question, well, what do I do then? Can I just go sin all I want? I would ask, well, what do you want in your new being? What does Christ in you want? Christ in you is not going to encourage you to go out with sin. That which nailed him to the cross is going to be of heart to us. So we have a new heart, a new spirit, and a new dynamic. So Paul goes on in verse 3 through 8, he, talks, he reveals three things about our baptism that they might not know and you might not know. What's it really all about? Well, let me read this, verse 4. Therefore we were buried with him through baptize, baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likenesses of his resurrection. Knowing this, we're to know this, that our old man was crucified with him. Our old man's not talking about your dad. That's about your old inner nature, what you were, no longer slaves of sin now. For who has died, he has died, is free from sin. So our, our baptism... You weren't baptized. There's no H2O water in spiritual baptism. Spiritual baptism is real baptism. You're placed in Christ. Water baptism is a ritual baptism that shows, that pictures what happened to you spiritually. But I'm afraid we come out of the baptismal water and we don't really comprehend and we're not teaching what the reality, what, what that means literally in your life. How now are you, what do we do with people who get saved and baptized? We give them a book of rules. Or maybe they're not written down, but we give the idea that if, you know, if you just avoid this and do avoid that and do this and do that, you're going to be all right. That is so far from the truth. It is no more rules and regulation. It's a relationship with that which is in you. And you're going to prove that two ways. Either by listening to the Holy Spirit and letting Christ be expressed through you or by denying it and sinning and being miserable. That's what makes you miserable because you're not made for that in your being. So he says, how in the world are you going to live in sin and enjoy it? In light of who you are in Christ, if you know what your baptism signifies. So I'm saying when Paul asked them, do you not know? He knows. They do not know, or they would not ask that question in the first one. I've already had lots of people, not lots, but some folks come to me and say, what about 
You keep emphasizing that our sins are forgiven forever. Well, what about? This is where the answer is. Something you need to know. Maybe you haven't heard. Maybe you've been running around with Christianity light. A lot of that around. Christianity light is, well, Jesus was a wonderful man. He lived 2,000 years ago. He went around doing a whole bunch of good things and, and taught us good rules and how we should live and love each other and so forth. Kind of like Buddha and Confucius. The only thing is he died. That's nice. Let's go home. What Jesus did you receive? When you got saved. Jesus the good man. 2,000 years ago. Or Jesus the living resurrected Christ. Who is able to forgive you. And cleanse you. And give you new life. It's the key here. To Christian living. So if we move from Christianity light. You're going to take the meaning of the cross. For you. For forgiveness. And the meaning of the resurrection in and through you for life. I am crucified with Christ, Galatians 2 point. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Well, why not I? Because the old I has been crucified, the new I. I've been crucified, but nevertheless, I live, I live, not I, but Christ lives in me. That's the new man. Hallelujah. So I don't need a bunch of rules. I can love Christ, live for Christ, and do what I want. That upsets some people. Because they're afraid they're going to want to do things they shouldn't do. They're missing the whole point. Your baptism showed that God changed your wanter. It's a new heart like yours. Don't you know this? So he talks here in verse 3 and on about our co-death. Our union with Christ in death. Why is that a factor? Because at Calvary, we were inserted into him on the cross. Sometimes people wear crosses around their neck. They might have an empty cross, or they might have Christ on the cross. But there's, this verse says, you were on the cross. I want to see a cross that says, me with Christ. That will really tell what that cross is all about. You are in him. The essential message of the cross is not only forgiveness, but that we participated with him. We were identified with him at Calvary. We died with Jesus, that old nature, the old man. Now, why I'm stressing this is because I continually hear people give the idea that we need to crucify ourselves. You need to crucify yourselves. Well, that's absurd. You may shoot yourself, hang yourself, starve yourself, but you're not going to crucify yourself. You might get one hand nailed up, but what are you going to do about the other hand? And you don't have to, what? Because you've already been crucified. That's what the cross is about. You need to know that. It took place 2,000 years ago. I'm crucified with Christ. Not will be, not need to be. I am crucified with Christ. It's a radical revelation here. Our union with Christ. And then our cold burial. Not only were we died with Christ, we were buried with Christ. Therefore, we're buried with him through baptism. Did he leave us in the tomb? Did he leave us on the cross? No. We did go to the tomb, but he didn't leave us there. Why? Because when someone dies, you take that body off the cross and put it in the tomb. Now, if the devil comes to me and says, hey, Chuck, and he's talking to the old Chuck, where is that old man? I say, he's dead. He said, well, I can't see him. I said, it's because he's been taken out of the way, and you can't drag him out and mock me over what that old man was. And yet there are many, many Christians that spend more time looking back at what they used to be instead of looking at how Christ has made them. Not perfect, but perfectly acceptable to them. <laughs> Our cold resurrection, Christ was dead, raised from the dead so that we also should walk in newness of life. Why all this cold death? 
cold burial, cold resurrection, that we could be raised to a newness of life. What is it? From where is the Christian life going to come? Not from you trying, from that new life that he's raised you. What is that new life? It's Christ in me. It's the Holy Spirit in me. We had to die in order to be made new. Now, I'm just going to have to draw and abbreviate this because that beef over there is just tempting me something terrible. <laughs> I'm just trying to say this is the key to the Christian faith, Christian living. It is not rules. It's not regulation. It's a loving obedience to a living Christ. It's a new way. So there's something to be reckoned. I'll just mention it. That's the second thing. There's something to be considered as a fact. Not because you can understand it, but because God says it. That's faith. You take this scripture, you say, boy, that is really quite something. I can't really explain that. You don't have to explain it. Just believe it. God says this is a fact. This is how you're going to live by faith. Galatians says, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, you're being now going to be made perfect by the flesh, by your self-effort? Let me go down and just one more time stress this verse 17. Thanks be to God. You want to be thankful for something this season? Here's a good place to start. That you were a slave to sins. That's what I used to be. I had a wicked heart. I was a slave to sin. I obeyed sin. But now... I had obeyed from the heart that form of document which has delivered me. That's from the heart. I have a new heart. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's something. And then there's something to yield. I'm going to just read verse 13 and I'll, I'll stop here. And do not present your members as, un, as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. There's something that we can do. You see, we make decisions, and the Christian life is a life of making the right decision. Who are you going to obey? Your body is just a tool. It's like a hammer in the hands of a right person that can do wonderful things, and a hammer to the wrong person that can do terrible damage. Don't yield yourself. The problem is we let the body and its passions and its habit of sin move us to more sin. When what God has said, I have delivered you from that, you now have a choice. What do you do when temptation comes? Just, Lord, that is not from you. And so I know that's either from the world, the flesh, or the devil, and I reject it, and I turn to you, and you begin to quote some scripture and rely upon God's Holy Spirit to overcome that. We're still living by the body of sin, that body that likes to sin. That's your physical appetites. That would, in your own flesh, be hard to overcome. You can take all the courses you want. We have so many recovery courses in our churches, and I want to say, why? It's Christ. Christ in you. We need to teach people how to let Christ in you live Christ out of you. I'm not against having courses where you talk to each other and help each other, but I'm saying the bottom line is you can take 14 steps and you're still going to have the trouble inside because it only dealt with what you do, not who you are. Am I making sense? Would you say amen so I can quit? <laughs> amen. All right. We're going to just draw a line here. If anything, I trust and I hope that I have uh, touched your heart and that you might follow this up. I recommend you read E.R. Major, The Enjoying Christ. It's a small book. E.R. Major, Major E.M.W. Thomas. It's Major E.M.W. Thomas, Enjoying Christ. Go to thriftbooks.com. That will help you so much. And so I'll pray like Paul said in the ending of 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. I pray, God, your whole spirit and body be preserved blameless until the coming of the Lord. 
Verse 24. And faithful is he who also will do it. How are you going to preserve yourself? Blameless. Christ. He that began a good work in you will perform it. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for your word. I pray the Holy Spirit would take this and touch hearts and bring enlightenment and bring enjoyment of what you have done and are doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.